about time to take down our Christmas tree, Kelly? Yeah, I think. Most people don't think much about gardening in the middle of the winter, but winter can be an important time for the garden. Sure, some of the most exciting moments of our gardening year can be on a snowy day in January. I'm Barbara Damrock. And I'm Elliot Coleman. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll show you ideas for starting seeds indoors in order to get a jump on the outdoor gardening season. On Gardening Naturally. Once the seeds arrive, unlike any other gardener, I'm anxious to get them into the ground, or at least into some potting soil ahead, so I have nice plants to put out when the weather warms. Now, you can go buy potting soil. It's sold many places. But I've always found that the store-bought potting soils don't have quite enough food in them to carry the plant to full size. And then I have to feed them, supplement them with a soluble feed. I'd rather not do that. And so Barbara and I have learned to make our own potting soil, which has enough food value to take the plants to full size. Now, it's an easy process, and we'll take you right through it. The first thing you need is some peat moss, this wonderful fibrous mixture, which couldn't be better to give you body in a mix. Take your hands, wiggle around in here, get rid of any lumps, and you're ready for the next step. The next step is to put some real food value in here, some minerals. And for that, I use the same ones we used in the garden. Here's some green sand, two tablespoonfuls to the three quarts of peat that I use. The same with phosphate rock. And the third one, which we don't often use in the garden, dried blood, because in the confines of a flat, we want to make sure that there's plenty of nitrogen to get these little plants off to a good start. Again, two tablespoonfuls. I put them in at this stage in the process because I want to get them mixed thoroughly with this nice light peat. In that way, I know that when the plant roots are down in here, they will find little bits of things like that in every part of the operation. All right, I have the body, but remember when we're talking about soil, we're talking about aeration, and now I need some aeration for this mix. So the plants, if that gets wet and sodden, don't miss the air. And for that, the best ingredient is perlite. Now, perlite is basically popped rock. In fact, it's a volcanic rock that has water in between its layers, it's heated up and pops, just like popcorn. Gives you a nice, fluffy product that when incorporated with peat in a mix like this, ah, now we have structure and aeration at the same time. And the last thing we're gonna add, and the thing that always makes everything grow better naturally, is compost. Right out of the garden, last fall, we saved it, sifted it so it's about as nice as could be. And I'm going to put in three containers of compost. Now, there's the formula. Three containers of peat, a container of perlite, and three containers of compost. And now when I mix all of this together, I have paradise for plants. Now, if you thought this looked like a cooking show so far, I'm going to make something like brownie mix here. I'm going to add water, quite a lot of water, to this beautiful potting mix I made. And I want to get it good and wet so it's almost sticky, not dripping water, but wet enough so I can do something with it that is really pretty unconventional in most people's gardening experience. I'm going to make a soil block out of it. In other words, I'm going to turn this into a little cube of soil in which to grow a plant that doesn't need walls around it. What does a soil block look like? This celery plant is growing in a soil block. And the soil block is made by using a simple tool like this block maker. It's just an ejection mold. I press this into it, push hard down to the bottom, and then eject them. And there I have perfect little cubes of potting soil, not needing any walls, in which plants can grow. What are the advantages? Well, you notice 
It has a little indentation in the top in which I put the seed. The walls, without any container around them, have air pruning on all sides where they're next to the others, and the roots of the plants in there grow to the edge and wait, and then they're ready to take off when they go in the ground. Now, celery grows quite slowly, so I wouldn't want to start celery in a block this big because I would have a lot of these big blocks hanging around, taking up a lot of room. So there's other techniques, even more fun. This is a soil block maker that makes 20 tiny little blocks. Press this in, put it here, and I have 20 tiny little blocks with an indentation on top. Now I put my celery seed in those, set them in a warm place for the celery to germinate, and then once it's germinated, and I have nice little celery plants, they need more room to grow. They need a block that big. Well, instead of the seed pins that are in this blocker, you can also equip it with little cubic pins that are the exact same size as those mini blocks. And so this time, same technique, press it in down hard, and then eject them. You end up with a block that has an indentation in the top the exact same size as this. And so when your little celery plant is up and growing and ready to move on, I put the square block in the square hole, and then it grows on to a big celery plant just like that. Are these things tender? Are they going to fall apart for you? No, I can actually throw this one up and down and catch it, and it's going to retain its shape. That's because the peat moss that we put in there really acts as a binder and holds all this together. And that, in my estimation, is the best way to start plants. The real advantage of the soil block maker is that as a resource, you only have to buy once. Now these two here would probably cost you $50 together, which isn't a bad investment, considering that you would easily spend that much on throwaway pots over a couple of years of gardening. With these, there's nothing to throw away. If you get really interested and want to expand your line, this one, ah, uh, now we're talking super soil block, turns out a block with a square hole in the top into which the two inch block fits. And now you have the full spectrum. But for many people, the combination of the three of these may be more than they want to invest. Can you make a soil block maker at home? You sure can. Let me show you how. I cut down a quart freezer container about a third of its height. I found a nice fat short bolt, drilled a hole in the bottom, put the bolt through, found a washer that would go over it, and then a nut for the bottom. I did that because I wanted to make it deep enough so I could put one of those mini blocks in there. Now, with this one, you don't push it down in. You would take the putting mix and push it into it like that because this has no plunger and you have to leave some space for the mix to fall out. These don't always work perfectly, but they're the cheapest and simplest, and you can use the top as a plate to make it on. You put it down here, you give a bang on the, on the top, maybe or two, shake it, and you have a reasonably nice soil block. Again, with a hole in the top for a big seed or one of those mini block makers. While Elliot's busy making us some soil blocks, I'm gonna get ready to plant them. I have some clary sage seeds here. The Latin name is Salvia viridis. And I think I've got about five weeks before these will be ready to go into the garden. You want to know how long ahead to start the seed. Each one is different. Often the seed packet will tell you. If not, you might want to do a little research. Some seeds can be sown directly in the garden. This one probably could. But I have a very short growing season, so I start quite a few of mine ahead. But before you even think about planting, I'm going to do one important thing, and let's make a label. Salvia viridis. And I'm going to put today's date on the stick. That way, if I get interrupted, I won't forget what it is I'm planting, and I'll know what's Rock going to come up. OK, now, there's a number of ways to put the little seeds into these blocks. If it were fairly large seeds, I could probably pick them up individually and put them in. Another way to do it, if you're very careful, is to crease the packet and tap them one by one. But probably the simplest way, what we do most often, is to sharpen the end of a paintbrush or a wooden dowel, put the seeds
foods on a white plate so you can see them easily. Pick them up with a moistened stick and one by one, pick them up and drop them into the little depression that the soil block maker makes in the block. The magic thing about the soil block system is that it's completely modular. I can take this little tomato seed and put it in the block and 10 days to two weeks later, it looks like that. Take that one, pot it on to the next size block and 10 days to two weeks later, it looks like this. Take that plant and stick it either in a large block or in a pot like this. And a few weeks after that, you have as nice a tomato plant as anyone would ever want to grow. So how long ago did you plant that tomato seed? To Just six plant? weeks. Amazing. Give it enough room to grow and it will grow. Now I've got my little flat all finished, so I've put the label in. And now I have to think about where to put this to have it germinate. Every seed is different and it helps to know whether it likes cool or warm temperatures for germination. If it likes a very cool temperature, say 65 degrees, I'll put it in a corner of my office where it's just about that. If it likes warm temperatures, 75, 80, even more, I'll stick it up on the top of the kitchen cabinet near the ceiling where it's always really warm. But most seeds like an average of about 70 degrees, and so I'll keep it on the kitchen counter or whatever place is handy at room temperature until it germinates. And to get it to germinate, the real key is to have the moisture correct. And so Barbara and I put our little flaps into a container like this, which has a fluted bottom, and into which we can pour some water, just up to the flutes. You don't want to flood the seeds, because then they won't germinate well, but we want to make sure there's a constant moisture supply. If we think they're a little dry, I'll take this spritzer occasionally and add some more moisture. Now, there's a cover that goes over this container, and that is what keeps the atmosphere in there perfectly moist while it's germinating. Now you notice we didn't cover the seeds, and you don't need to in a perfectly moist atmosphere, except for those few seeds that say on the back of the packet that they want to germinate in the dark. And if that were the case, I would have laid a little piece of black plastic down there before I put the cover on. Put the cover on, keep it moist, put it in a warm spot, and everything works perfectly. But keep your eye on them, because the minute they start to germinate, you want to take the cover off, and put them in a warm, sunny window. Sun, not with the cover on, because then the heat in there is gonna to become too intense because this is like a little closed greenhouse with no vents. Cover off in a sunny window the minute they germinate and you're off and running. And you really do have to keep checking them about twice a day. When we put them on top of the kitchen cabinet, we have to remind each other constantly. The other thing I do as soon as they germinate is to get out my little list. I, this is one area where I really do keep records because I love to know when, how long it took for each seed to germinate. It not only helps me next year to know how far ahead I have to do things, but if I want to have two plants sharing a flat, if they both germinate at about the same time, then I can move the whole plant to the right place at the right time for both those plants. And here's a flat, of all germinated and ready to go. Okay, those are the salvia viridis that I started eight days ago. So there they are, and they are definitely ready to be moved on to bigger soil blocks. Now I'll take this little tool, which is simply a, an artist's palette knife that you can get at any artist supply store, and I'll cut out a little block, lift it up. Now it may have a tap root. One of the advantages of using soil blocks is that plants that don't like being disturbed when they're transplanted, because one reason or another, usually because they have a tap root, they do a lot better in a soil block than with another kind of transplanting. There's living proof. Oh, the proof is in the plant. Because here are some that were planted about five weeks ago, tap roots and all, and they don't seem to have suffered one bit. No, they look lovely. And one thing I mentioned earlier, the idea that in a soil block you get air pruning of the roots because the roots grow to the edge of the block, and instead of circling around as they do in the container, fill in the block and wait there to be transplanted in the soil. This is a perfect example of the advantage of soil blocks for almost all types of seedlings. These are ready to go into the garden. I think they are. Let's put them in. Okay. There's no question that the best place to grow plants for your spring garden is in a greenhouse. But not everyone has one, and I have a great suggestion for a low-cost, just as successful alternative, the cold frame. Our cold frame is right in front of our house. 
the sun comes in, house faces south, it couldn't be a better spot. Now, why don't we use the south-facing window in the front of our house? Because the house has an overhang on the front. And the sun is high in the sky, and the shadow cast comes below this window by early April. Any plants growing in there wouldn't get enough light. So this is the best possible home for them. The first thing to think about when using a cold frame is to vent it. The sun's coming in there, that's what's good, that's what keeps it warm. But if it gets too warm, you'll cook the plants before you're ready to eat them. I vent mine with just these little notch sticks by putting them up just like that. And on the edge of these frames, not on the bottom end. The reason I do that is because where I live, the prevailing wind comes from this direction. And therefore, if there's a puff, it can't get under the glass to lift it to cause me trouble. Now, along with venting, the next consideration is if you want to grow warm weather plants in here, you need some extra heat. And what we do to do that is we have a wonderful little ceramic heater in here. Just a small one, but that allows us to put enough heat in there so we can make the hot weather plants, the heat-loving plants, happy. Take a look at this beautiful frame of peppers and eggplants. I've got some flower seedlings here that are coming along very nicely, but they're not ready to go into the ground yet. We still have some danger of frost here, maybe for the next week or two, but I'm going to bring them outside the coal frame and harden them off. That simply means getting them used to being outdoors. If I keep them in the coal frame here, which has a little heater in it, or inside the house, they're in pretty pampered conditions. They don't get extremes of cold or heat. Now, that wouldn't happen in nature. You wouldn't take something out of a pampered situation and plunge those roots into cold soil. The seedlings would come up, they'd, the weather would gradually get warmer, and they'd have some cold nights, some hot days, and they'd toughen up. So that's what I'm going to try to do with these plants. There's several ways to go about this. I could just leave the glass tops off the coal frames more and more each day, maybe go through a few frost-free nights with them off. But I'm not going to do that because Elliot has some tomato seedlings in there that he's still trying to bring on, and so he'll want this to keep warm. So instead, I'm just going to set them outside the coal frame, keep them here to harden off, but the minute frost threatens some night, I'm going to pop them back in and close them up so they'll be protected. The leaves, the stems will all toughen up over the course of the next week or two so that when I set them in the garden, they'll be ready for it. In our cool climate, if we want to grow melons, we have to go to the sort of trouble that someone in a warmer climate would go to to get extra early melons. We have to create a warmer growing condition. And the first thing for that is to warm up the soil. And the best way to do that is to use a black plastic like this. Now this is actually an improved black plastic. The old ones were totally opaque. This is called infrared transmitting plastic. It lets the heat waves through, but doesn't let enough light through so weeds can grow underneath. Therefore, it has all the benefits and none of the disadvantages, a great product. In order to put it down, I stretched a string along this edge, went along with the spade and made a clean cut, put the soil aside, and then now I'm stretching it tightly and pushing the soil back over to hold it in place. The more tightly you can put it in, the better it'll stay, it won't flap in the wind, the closer it is to the soil and the more effective it is. Warms the soil, grows better melons. Now there's a second stage to this. This is a, what's called a floating cover. This is just a very lightweight material that I will also tuck in on the edges it will cover the melon plants when they're planted here and provide something like a low horizontal greenhouse. Since it's so lightweight, it doesn't need hoops or anything to hold it up. That's why it's called the floating cover. Now I have my melon plants here. They're not ready to go in. They're a week away from being ready to go in and I'm a week away from being ready to plant them. But that's the whole point. You want to put this plastic down a week before you put your melons in and then make sure the soil is warm and ready for them to go in there. Now the technique for putting them in, you need to cut a hole in the plastic every place you plan to put a melon. Take a sharp knife and just cut a little square out of the plastic where your plant's going to go in. Then the easiest way to remove the soil I've found is to use a bulb digger like this because it picks it up and takes it out of there. You don't want it in there. I square off the hole. I'll take one of my melon plants as a sample and put it down in there. 
tuck it in, and it's in place. Now the final step is to put the floating cover in place. Bury it along the edge just like I did with the black plastic and it'll hold against the wind. But there's one final consideration. You want to put it over here, but not for the whole summer. Because once the melon spreads and begins to make blossoms, insects have to get to those blossoms to pollinate them. So you want to peek under here every so often. And when you start to see blossoms, remove the floating cover and roll it to the back. It's now fall and the first frost is imminent. But even in a cool climate like ours, the reward for all your melon care is a bounteous harvest of fresh melons. I'm glad we started those salvias ahead. I'm really eager for some fast color here. Well, this is a perfect spot because the rest of this is vegetable. Some flowers in front are going to look sensational. Sure, it'll look neat. Where do you want to put them? Well, they're kind of medium height. Let's put a, a staggered row down the center of the bed. Okay, you dig. I'll hand plant. You know, starting plants ahead may seem like work, but the rewards make it really worthwhile. Earlier flowers, earlier vegetables. I love it. Well, we've got a bit of work to do here. So until next time, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, get started on easy home projects that anyone can handle here on Home Buddies. Then indulge your creative side with Debbie Stapley on Crafts & Company here on TLC.